Good evening. Welcome to Temple Shalom. I'm Rabbi Ariel Boxman. I am joined this evening by my clergy partners, Rabbi Adam Miller and Cantor Donna Azu. We acknowledge and thank the Jewish Federation of Greater Naples for co-sponsoring this event. In addition, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished guests, Mayor Teresa Heitman and Vice Mayor Terry Hutchinson. In the hustle and bustle of our daily lives, it is not often that we take the time to pause and express our gratitude to those who dedicate themselves to the service of our community. Today, we have the opportunity to do just that, to acknowledge the tireless efforts, unwavering commitment, and steadfast leadership of two individuals who have played an instrumental role in shaping the future of our city. Their presence here today serves as a testament to their deep-rooted commitment to the Jewish community and to the importance of bearing witness to critical moments in history. Their leadership has been a guiding light in times of uncertainty, a source of inspiration in moments of doubt, and a beacon of hope for all who call this place home. Like many of you, I awoke on October 7th to learn that Israel was under attack. Although we didn't know the extent of the brutality in those first few hours, as the hours ticked on, images appeared, and firsthand accounts flooded social media, the horror became apparent. In recent months, we have seen pictures, watched videos, read articles, and perhaps even visited Israel to volunteer. However, this evening, we have a rare opportunity to bear witness, to hear directly from survivors of the horrific attack perpetrated by Hamas on October 7th. As Elie Wiesel once said, Whoever listens to a witness becomes a witness. This evening, each and every one of us in the sanctuary will become a witness. A witness to the horrors of October 7th, so that we too can say, never again. Never again is right now. Never again is today. We take a moment now to watch a short video about Kibbutz Kfar Aza. A kibbutz in the Gaza envelope, one of the most brutally attacked kibbutzim on October 7th. Our survivors today are all from this kibbutz and will be sharing their stories shortly. All I want is to go home. I have days where I just, I want to go back home. I want to sit in my, on my front porch and I want to know that Sal is sleeping in her bed uh, with the window slightly open so we can hear her if she cries, knowing that my parents are up the road and, and just hearing the quiet. Beautiful place, Kibbutz Kfar Aza. Very beautiful place. I loved it. I've been living there for the last 45 years. I still see it as my home. A lot of things that I love to do in the Kibbutz, especially with my grandchildren, and having a very rich community life, especially celebrating the holidays together. Life was very good. It was returning of young generations, tradition, solidarity. The community starts with my group. This is second family for me. I don't know how to say it, but the community is part of me. And it's uh, what I like the most in Farada. 95% paradise and 5% hell. Now it's turned all over. We moved to Farada about two months before the October 7th events. Our home was very nice. We liked it. It was friendly, it was quiet, it was felt like the right decision. We hear Arabic very early in the morning, before seven. 
they were outside our window. So we understood very early that it's different. Uri sits with us maybe for two minutes and he goes outside. And the girls say, did dad leave? And I say, dad doesn't leave without saying goodbye. So uh, a terrorist with a weapon and wearing a Hamas uniform, he was wearing a band on his head and he was yelling, it was you were calling people, gathering people to come over as he already conquered the kibbutz. Soon enough, we got messages from people. The terrorists are entering the houses, invading their homes and trying to open the safe room. You hear them talking, not even shouting. You hear them talking in Arabic and I don't have the words to explain the, the feelings, but it's in your home. Gata text message by the family, WhatsApp. Help us, the terrorists are here, trying to get inside the Mamad. My mom sent a message at 4.59 that their um, terrorists are trying to break into their house. And uh, three minutes later, she sent a message that they broke uh, the safe room door. Please come and help us right now. And that was the last message that she sent. got the message that Ophir Lipstein, which is a good friend of us, was murdered. We realized that something bad is happening and this is not the end. My sister tells me her son was hurt, so I'm contacting her husband and I'm asking him, Ori, tell me something. And then he writes back, uh, Ophir, Neta and my mother were killed. Neta is 22 years old. He jumped on the grenade to keep Irene safe. The IDF came to our house. I kept walking forward to the soldiers and asking them if they've been to my parents' neighborhood, if they know what happened. And they said, we have no idea. There are other forces there. We were only here. We're very sorry. You have no idea what you're talking about, what this neighborhood is, where it is. We don't know. We can't answer. The combat unit was very much alone. Most of them were killed next to the weaponry. Uri and Tal, I don't know how, but they made it out of there. They arrived to the grass, to a big grass next to the swimming pool, and they were killed there. After they bombed my house, those soldiers came and told me, listen, we're sorry, we had to do some renovation in your house to make sure that those terrorists are dead. And that's uh, how we were rescued after 35 hours. We lasted and we stayed alive. What we didn't know, that uh, Tal, my son, was already dead since Saturday morning. So it's been a uh, like tough days. We lost two friends and uh, two others that uh, are now kidnapped in Aza. Got in Zip. When we got here Sunday night, we still didn't realize what was happening. But we knew that something terrible, horrible has happened to all of us. Afterwards, we started to feel uh, the support of those from our community who stayed alive and didn't lose uh, family. Behind that were the people of Kibbutz Shvaim, who really hugged us in so many ways. There was a Kfar Aza community and enveloped by Shvaim community. And this entire body of two communities almost became one, but rose from the ashes. Their spirit is strong. I mean, people, even if they lost their relatives or friends, people are strong. Even if they're uh, Deers are, were kidnapped and they're still in Gaza. They are strong and they fight and they, they won't, they won't give up. The group is giving me most of the powers that I'm living with them now. The people that I want to be with them 
right now because they just understand me and they they are like me. Uh, we're in the same situation. And, uh, no one else can be in this place. This is the source of my powers now. It's my home, it's where I grew up. I've always come back to it, even if I really didn't want to. <laughs> I somehow found myself gravitating back. I believe that eventually one day we'll go back, we'll come back and we'll, we'll make this place our home again. I think people will go back to Faza. I know some people sleeping there today. It's their house. It's their home. The wishful thinking, peace. <laughs> the wishful thinking is uh, to see the community going back to Kfaraza, rebuilding it. I want to see kids hanging around on the playgrounds, on the playing soccer on, in the fields. And um, I want to see women with strollers, you know, with babies, mothers, fathers with babies. I want my community back, I really do. It is my honor now to invite Eti Levy, Deputy Director of the Kfar Aza Foundation, who has been tirelessly raising money to support the survivors of this massacre and aid in the rebuilding of their homes. Please join me in welcoming Eti to the Bima. Hi, everyone. I want to start by saying thank you all for being here and special thanks to Ariel for creating this opportunity for us to come and speak to you directly and share the stories of Kfar Aza directly with you. You've heard a little about uh, what happened and I uh, would like to tell you a little bit more about what was before in Kfar Aza. Kibbutz Kfar Aza was established in 1951, very close to the Gaza Strip. On the evening of October 7th, there were about 950 residents in the kibbutz, including 233 children and 135 seniors. Despite numerous rocket attacks uh, during the past years, the kibbutz was striving the economic, uh, uh, the economic prosperity of the kibbutz was superb, thanks to uh, the plastic factory, Kafrit, uh, that belongs to the kibbutz. They had a superb educational system, uh, 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 agricultural branches, and the kibbutz was very successful. There was a 200, uh, uh, two years waiting list uh, to be accepted to the kibbutz, and there were 200 families on this waiting list. To say that the life in, in Kfaraza, like Leora said in the video, were, were 95% heaven. And you can only imagine uh, how uh, devastated was October 7th when it happened. Uh, hundreds of Hamas terrorists invaded the kibbutz, invaded the, res the houses of uh, the residents over there, burned, abused, kidnapped, raped. The kibbutz residents became uh, refugees in their own country overnight. They were uh, rescued and evacuated to Shvaim Hotel with nothing but what they had on uh, at that moment. Um, they lost family members, friends, their homes, and their livelihood. Uh, most of them uh, were evacu evacuated to Shvaim, as I said. Um, and now we're staying there and trying to uh, start the healing process. Uh, the foundation, the Kfar Aza Foundation, was established on October 7th thanks to, to amazing people who wanted to reach out and help. And I've joined the team two months ago uh, when, with one thing on my mind, in my heart, and it's to 
have support to Kfar Aza so they'll be able to return to uh, what it used to be. Our vision for the rehabilitation of Kfar Aza includes three stages. In the immediate term, most of the kibbutz residents are currently staying in Shvaim, and the rest is scat scattered all over the country. The immediate challenge is to provide their material, physical, and mental needs. Um, and we basically, and at this point, we understand that we'll have to uh, address that. In the midterm, a temporary settlement will be established for the Kfar Aza community in Kibbutz Hulchama, which is closer to Kfar Aza, yet a bit further. Uh, this will require the establishment of temporary educational system, cultural life, and a financial structure. During this period, the uh, kibbutz structure will remain scattered, as some will continue to live in various uh, housing arrangements around the country, and we'll have to figure it out as we go. And in the long term, our goal is uh, the rebuilding of Kfar Aza as a prosperous, joyful, excuse me, joyful and safe community. Uh, it requires uh, a lot of uh, physical uh, surrounding support, a uh, reestablishment of the kibbutz social, cultural, educational, and occupational infrastructure, but this is definitely our end goal. And we hope that despite the excruciating pain, we consider the restoration of Kfar Aza and its return to its original site uh, to be our highest goal. Uh, we believe that uh, from the destruction and pain, the kibbutz will bloom, renew our, its days as before, and uh, return to being a source of personal and national pride. On, in, I mean, for, for me, as an individual, who was in Israel when it happened, enjoyed the foundation. I must say you obviously would never see me here if not uh, after the event. And we're basically here to reach out and raise as much support as possible because for us this is a litmus test in a way as a society uh, to be able to grow out of the situation to uh, grow hopefully and be stronger and flourish. And this is our nature, this is our culture, this is what we do as a people, as the Jewish people, but also uh, as uh, hopeful people. So we are here to share the stories, to uh, basically ask you to, for support, but also to be the voice of Kfar Aza after you hear uh, the members here. So thank you all for being here, and have, I hope you enjoy. Thank you. We'll now have an opportunity to hear directly from our survivors who are with us this evening. I'll interview them, and then hopefully we'll have a few moments for some Q&A. If you'll join us on the BIMA. Thank you again for being here, all of you. I want to start by asking if you'll each take an opportunity to introduce yourselves and tell us where were you on October 7th. First of, first of all, uh, good evening for all of you that are coming. I must to tell you that I feel that we are this is my first time here in this town, but I feel the warming from you, that we are one family. 
even we are from Kfaraza, and you live here, and thank you that you are coming, and we feel your warming. Thank you. Uh, my name is Doron Admoni. Uh, I live in Kfaraza almost uh, more than 35 years. Uh, I have uh, four kids, two from uh, my first wife and another two from the second wife. And uh, I make it shorter, in October 7, I was with my older daughter in uh, California. I have a son that lives in, in California. He married to American, and uh, he's become citizen of American. And uh, we came to visit our new granddaughter. And uh, my wife, Michal, stay in Kfaraza this weekend with Guy, our uh, son. He was uh, 25 years old. He was a captain in the army, in the intelligent. And uh, there was on this weekend together. Michal was 100% uh, handicap. Uh, she made uh, operation 17 years ago. And uh, on this week before, she didn't feel good, and uh, she asked a guy to be with her on this weekend. And uh, our youngest daughter, Gali, she's uh, 20 years old. She was in the army. On Friday, her mom, Michal, told her she can go to visit her boyfriend for a weekend. She can take the, our car, and in the end, she survived. Uh, Saturday, October 7, 6.30 a.m., I got a message from Michal. I was in California. It was about 8 o'clock p.m. There a lot of noises in the kibbutz, and uh, our dog ran away. And uh, what I can do, you know, usually we have some bombs, usually we run f uh, to our uh, shelter, to safe room, and after a few minutes, we go out. Nobody thought in this time, it was early in the morning, because our house, it's close to the border of the, of the kibbutz. And after 15 minutes, we got a message from the community that probably terrorists in the kibbutz, inside the kibbutz, all the people have to be in the safe room and lock, lock the, the, themselves. And after 15 minutes, about quarter to seven o'clock, I send a message to my friends that Michal and Guy not with us. Nobody told me, but I felt that I was in California. And I told them, you can find them together, hang, hang, hang each other in the safe room, but they are dying already. I don't know how to explain what's happened, uh, what my feeling was. But after four days, they found them in this situation. Uh, but also, it was for my family some miracles. First of all, my youngest daughter, safe. Her mom sent to her on Friday, the day before. And our two granddaughter, that living in the kibbutz, also safe, and uh, survived. 
and we are decide to continue our life, not give up. And to talk and to send the message that the light that Michal and Guy show to the world. Michal was a, a writer. She published already two books after she became handicapped. And uh, two weeks before October 7, she finished, she told me she finished the third book. It's now on the laptop. And we are going, we are going to publish this, the third book. And uh, I lost 40% for my family, but also we lost our house, we lost our community, and we have uh, to rebuild, and we need your help. And I'm sure it will take time, but in the end, if, if we will be biyachad, kulanu biyachad, we will win in the end. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lir Susana. I'm 27 years old. I'm from Kibbutz Kfar Aza. My parents live in Kfar Aza and my two older brothers live in Kfar Aza. Uh, one of them has a five months old baby boy. He was five months old back in October 7th. Uh, we woke up at 6.30 hearing the alarms, the Tseva Adom alarms, but this was unusual. We heard loads of sounds that I've never heard, including gunfire. So I told to my dad, let's go out. We need to see what's going on outside. And as soon as we went out, a member of the local emergency squad, the Kitat Konenut, was running across the street and screaming, there's loads of terrorists inside the kibbutz. Go into your safe room. So it was me, my parents, my boyfriend, and seven dogs. I'm a therapy dog trainer, so this is our, yeah. Um, my brother lives in another part of the kibbutz, and my brother went out and he saw an IDF soldier. He went to approach him, and then he pulls out his Kalachnikov and tried to shoot him. Most of them looked like IDF soldiers. Lots of them knew how to speak Hebrew and how to say the IDF codes. At that moment, he saw something like 15 um, terrorists around his house, and he went back home and gathered his neighbors to his home because he was armed, he had a pistol. My other brother described uh, them outside, partying, smoking, drinking. He says that the dissonance was crazy. He could hear girls screaming and them partying. They had time, like you heard, um, to do brutal things. We were rescued 22 hours later and my brothers were rescued 32 hours later and my parents were rescued 40 hours later. A week after, our family went back to the kibbutz. Uh, my dad had some like family meeting, told us that we need to, come to go back uh, to bring stuff to the community. People needed clothes, they went out with nothing on them. They needed everything also for the people that was murdered or hostages, they needed DNA samples to try and figure out what happened with them. So we needed to take it from their houses. When I arrived to Kfaraza, Kfaraza was full of terrorists, um, dead terrorists that were wired, booby trapped. Their friends did it, dead dogs that were booby trapped loads of RPGs, grenades. I had to go with eight soldiers just with me so I can go to the houses and try to take stuff. 
En ja. Um, yeah. Thank you. My name is Ayelet. Uh, I was born in another kibbutz near the Sea of Galilee, a beautiful one. I met the love of my life, and he was from Kfar Aza, so I went to Kfar Aza. Uh, I've been living in Kfar Aza for 40 years, so I won't tell you my age, but you can uh, guess. <laughs> um, well, in that day, my husband went uh, for a trip, jeep. He was uh, fond of jeeps, and he went for uh, a lot of jeep tr trips. Uh, in that day, uh, at 6.25, he went for a trip. I was asleep. And then he, f he called me. In the same time, the massive attack, missile, massive attack of my missiles and bombs. Um, he asked me whether I am in the safe room, which I must tell you, it's, it's not safe at all. We didn't know that then. Uh, I said yes, and he said, well, I'm coming. I told him, don't come, there is such a massive attack, uh, you can be killed. And he said, ah, don't uh, talk, you know, nonsense, and I'm coming. It was something 20 uh, to 7, and he didn't come. And I waited, really, I... I I waited and I was very focused to hear voices. I didn't lock the house uh, because I thought he, he might come. Suddenly, I heard shoutings in Arabic behind my window, which was um, closed, you know, but I heard them and I threw, I don't know what, stones or whatever on the window and my husband didn't come. And at about, I called him all the time, called him, called him, and prayed my heart that he will answer to me, uh, which he didn't. Um, and, um, sorry. Um, uh, after half an hour, something like that, I realized that if, he's, if he doesn't come, he's not alive. Um, and noises and, and rifle shootings all the time. And, you know, we used to missiles, but not to those kind of noises of, well, first of all, you know, uh, shoutings in Arabic and uh, uh, rifles, and it was just, nearby and so close. Um, now, I'm a psychotherapist, and uh, my sp one of the sp my specialty is post-trauma. <laughs> so I was very focused not to be in post-trauma after weeks or months. And that means that I have to be very active all the time. I decided that I won't think about my husband and I will just be very active. While thinking about that, a terrorist came into my house. They just ruined it. They, sh they shoot everywhere. Even the air condition, they, just, they drop the air, con air conditions down and uh, shoot all over and um, broke everything. Um, and went. So I decided I will go outside because I understood something very severe is going on. And God knows how, how long we will stay in the safe room. Uh, so I went outside, took water, flashlight. There was no water, no electricity, no, not media, nothing. Everything was shut down. Um, I took water, some food that I have 
head in the fridge and uh, went inside. Now it was such a big mountain in front of my um, uh, shelter's door. They, they missed it somehow, it's a miracle. Um, so I went inside and um, just began to meditate. And I don't do meditation uh, usually, but there's nothing to do, you know, hours and hours. So I began to meditate and um, uh, visit all the museums I've been, uh, see all those beautiful pictures. And every time my husband came to my, um, to my mind, I just went to another country. And uh, afterwards, after I was in the shelter for 30 hours, 30 hours, and suddenly I heard um, like um, radio, you know, army radio. Everybody who was in the army knows what I mean. It was such a sound of the radio, and and I opened the window very slowly, and I saw soldiers, and um, they asked, is anybody alive here? It's something I will never forget. But I didn't answer because I knew the terrorists knew Hebrew and they spoke in Hebrew and I heard them speak in Hebrew like before they said, everybody go out, this is the IDF, we will take care of you, but we knew, I mean, I knew that they were terrorists. Okay, so after those uh, 30 years, uh, 30, oh, it was like 30 years, uh, 30 hours, um, they came to rescue me. I, I shouted uh, that I'm here. And they said, don't move, the house is wired. Uh, I didn't mention that the terrorists came three times to my house. Every time they came, I went inside the uh, cupboard in the shelter, uh, waited for them <laughs> to leave. Um, so the soldiers came and just took me. They said, don't move. I didn't move. They just pushed me with a body, which was very weird <laughs> in that. <laughs> but um, this is how I got out. Then we went to a central place where everybody, where, we, where everybody from the kibbutz, all the survivors of the kibbutz were. Everybody asked me, where is Kachko, which is my husband? I said, he's dead. And they said, how do you know he's dead? Well, he's not dead, maybe he's, he was kidnapped. I said, no, he's dead, because I know him. If he would have been alive, even in Gaza, I would have known that. I know he's dead. And so it was. <laughs> so thank you for hearing and... Yeah. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sergei, and uh, I'm father of uh, Eitan, 10 years old, and uh, Eden, 8 years old. Uh, with the uh, alarm, Seva Dom, uh, they came to me. I took them to the safe room, and uh, I got a message in a WhatsApp group of uh, emergency <laughs> local. Local emergency, Local emergency team, squad, kitat kununut, whatever you say. Uh, so uh, we got a message in there that uh, one of one of us saw parachutes that crossing uh, border of the kibbutz with people. So a few minutes later, uh, we, we wrote there that, that everybody hearing uh, shotguns everywhere in the kibbutz and. Uh, uh, I started my way to armory that was a point of meeting of all members of Kitat Kununut. Uh, I took my <laughs> my wife's bicycle that I thought the best way to <laughs> reach there, and uh, there I met my there I 